Hello, I'm Ann Guerin. We are going to talk today about a uh, new book, The Dictator's Handbook, which, as I understand, builds on work that both of you have done uh, over a number of years um, in, uh, in, in some previous uh, political science work. Can you explain how The Dictator's Handbook is different from your previous theories about how dictators and autocracies function differently than, uh, than, than democracies? And at whom is this book primarily aimed? Well, uh, the prior work, uh, academic work, uh, take the, our book, The Logic of Political Survival, it's a 500 page book with about 150 pages of calculus. There's no calculus in this book. There are no statistics in this book. There's not even algebra in this book. That's an important difference. There's this a is little a math. <laughs> There's a little math, right? <laughs> this is a book uh, aimed at an intelligent, politically interested audience, uh, people who read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, uh, people like that. Uh, the earlier work was aimed at the three other academics who want to read uh, 150 pages of calculus. <laughs> would that be a fair description? I think that would be exactly fair. We've tried here to uh, popularize and translate difficult technical material into something that's straightforward and easy to understand because our arguments are very general. They're about how political organizations, how religious organizations, how corporations, how charities, how any kind of organization works. And so all we needed to, uh, the, the purpose of this book was we spend a lot of time talking to students, talking to fellow academics, and of course we never talk about, you know, the, the following function is increasing and all the calculus terms, and we don't give the statistics all the time, we use an example. And we just thought, so we decided to write the book, and to be honest, it was a book that wrote itself. It was incredibly easy because we have this wonderful idea about how politics works, that it's based upon self-interest and constraints that people have to operate within this system. And, you know, the jostling of who's going who's to get their way and who isn't. And it was a book that we'd say we just, story after story just fell into place. And so we've written it for a general audience. Can you explain a bit more about that theory of self-interest that goes back to some, to, to some of your earlier work? Is it always the case that a leader will act primarily in his or her self-interest, uh, trumping every other absolute. potential motivation? Well, that, that's the absolute dominant motivation. So people have different things that they would like to do, and if they have some discretion, they may want to advance good public works projects. They may want to push for some kind of uh, religious preference over something. But they, first and foremost, you can't do any of that stuff until you secured yourself in power and taken care of the people who keep you in power. So that's what has to be done first. So before anything else, people take care of that. Well, we don't deny that there might be sort of benevolent people who care about others first, but they're not the ones that crushed the heads that got them to the top in the first place. How far across the political uh, spectrum does that uh, theory of paramount the self-interest extend? I mean, I can understand in a country in which there's a, a, a cult of personality, one leader who gets to essentially make all the decisions, um, that that would be an easier model to sustain than it might be in uh, a country where, say, there's a junta or uh, going all the way on the other side where there is a democratically elected government. How far does that spread? So the theory applies to all governments, indeed, to all organizations. Now, what the theory tells us is that leaders need to obey to the extent that they can five rules. The problem that they have, which is what you're alluding to, is that depending upon the nature of the political system, the uh, amount of constraints they face in changing the way the system operates is greater or lesser. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we see it, leaders want to depend on as few people as possible to keep them in power. They want those few people to be drawn from as large a pool of available people as possible. They want to tax people as much as they can, subject to the limitation that they not try to tax so much that the economy collapses on their watch, and not so much that they foment a rebellion. So there's an optimal level. 
They want to make sure to pay those few people they need properly so that those folks won't want to defect to somebody else, not a penny more, and they don't want to make the mistake of spending money on people who are not essential to keep them in power. So, as we see it, um, a dictator, com contrast with the junta leader, uh, what people think of as a dictator is somebody who depends on very few people drawn from a relatively large pool of people. For example, uh, Lenin invented a universal adult suffrage system in which everybody knew the elections were rigged, but there was a very small probability for any individual that they could get into that little group of insiders. It wasn't the royal family as it had been, uh, and they could get payoffs. They could get lots of benefits. As the set of people you depend on gets bigger, bribing people gets to be too expensive. You know, if you have to bribe 100 people, not so hard. If you have to bribe 10 million people, it's better to start producing effective public policy. It's cheaper than the bribery. So as the coalition that you depend on gets bigger, loyalty to the leader gets weaker because they're saturating more of the pool, so there's not a lot of substitutes. Uh, the p quality of policy gets better, and the leader gets thrown out of office more quickly. So a junta leader depends on a small coalition, just like a dictator, but a junta leader depends on a small coalition drawn from a small group, for example, of generals. And a dictator depends on a small coalition potentially drawn from a huge coalition. So the junta leader doesn't have as much loyalty. They, get, they face coups and overthrow much more frequently than the guy who has the same little coalition, but drawn from a big pool where everybody knows they're easily replaced. Those are an awful lot of, uh, of, of rules. I mean, you, you, you listed the five um, main ones, but it, it, it almost sounds as if a good, durable dictatorship is, is, is a bit of an accident of history. I mean, how could all of those things so uh, easily be reproduced in so many countries over... Uh, over well, it's so not an accident time? of history. In, in fact, one of our technical papers is about how it is that some governments evolve to be democratic and some governments evolve to be dictatorial or autocratic, um, it's actually very easy to construct a dictatorship. Uh, take an example, we, we, we use this analogy in the book. Suppose we're in a room of 100 people and five of us have guns. The five of us are going to run that room mm -hmm. if nobody else has a gun. So uh, dictatorship, creation of dictatorship is generally about controlling violence, controlling the opportunity to engage in violence and not being hesitant about using it. Um, democracy is about being very hesitant to use it because we will throw the rascals out. Uh, we, we, we vote with the ballot box instead of the bullet. It's much harder to construct democracy than dictatorship. Well, I mean, by your model, democracy is a, uh, uh, a much more self-limiting operation, right? I mean, you can't, you can't mm -hmm. do all of those things over and over and over and over and over again in a democracy because, as you say, you'll, you'll throw, throw the bums out. Um, but it, it, it also just sort of isn't built that way, right? You can't, as you say, bribe that many people. You can't, you can't effectively mm -hmm. run that large an organization if people keep getting to vote on how that organization is being run. Am, am, am I Well, we always here? have to have an executive that makes decisions. So we, we have leaders, we choose to retain them if they do the things that we like. And so the basis of the theory is, what does it mean to do things that we like? And it turns out things that we like depend upon how many of us get to pick. So this is the, the basis of the argument. In a democracy, there's many, many people. So in the US, to be president, you need about 35, 34, 35 million votes is enough to win the presidency. In a country, we might think of it as a democracy, but that's a country of a, over 300 million people because not everybody's eligible. And if you can pick the right votes in the right states, you can win half the electoral college seats, and that's all you need to win. Mm -hmm. So that's always a thing to remember is the president gets more votes than that, but how many does he need? And we can sort of see that 
uh, Congress at the moment, the debate between the Republicans and Democrats is tailored towards rewarding a smaller section of society than rewarding everybody. If we take the system down to an even smaller system, when we're talking, for example, we could go, uh, let's, let's move away from politics to a moment, we talk about a business enterprise, and we, we might sort of wonder why is it that Wall Street firms have been paying out huge bonuses you know, the people are in uproar, the people want these guys, they want to rip their livers out. You know, these people are feeding from the public purse to pay big bonuses. And, and what's the reason here? Well, most publicly traded corporations, they run like autocracies. There's a relatively small number of board members, senior executives, institutional investors, you know, often in the tens, certainly not much more than the hundreds, who are really important to staying at the top. So how do you reward a small number of people? Well, you pay them hugely. You give them enormous bonuses. You don't run them by giving out public goods. So we see that everybody would like to get cut down the number of people they're beholden to because that lets them to give fabulous wealth to those small numbers of supporters. Is that why, uh, for example, uh CEOs and board members get paid lots of money, but so so do college, uh, uh, big, you know, Big Ten uh, football coaches, right? Yes, yeah. yes. The highest paid uh, government employee uh, in, at the federal level in the United States is the coach of the Army football team. Really? Yes, <laughs> by far. It's not even close. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 Alistair Travis. makes a very important point about uh, democracy. So democratic leaders have the misfortune of needing a lot of people to support them, but they work as hard as they can to reduce that number of people. Um, so the Congress is one of the least popular institutions in the United States, and yet an individual member of Congress, has an, uh, an incumbent, has a 95% probability of re-election. Why is that? That's because the politicians have chosen their voters the voters are not choosing the politicians. They choose their voters by gerrymandering. They rig the system mm -hmm. so they don't really have to answer to so, to so many people. And who do they reward? Well, we have a, 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 a favorite rhetorical question. Uh, journalists would have us believe that President Obama wants to raise taxes on the rich and that uh, the Republicans want to cut benefits to the poor. We prefer to express that differently. Obama, President Obama, wants to raise taxes on Republican voters, and Republicans want to cut benefits to Democratic voters, because that doesn't cost their constituents right. anything. It puts it, it helps to enrich their constituents at the expense of the other guy. The uh, the subtitle of, of, of your book is Why Bad Behavior is Almost Always Good Politics. Can you talk a little bit about perhaps some of the exceptions to, to this overall theory? Why mm -hmm. is it almost always good politics? Once in a blue moon, and I mean once in a blue moon, it becomes in everyone's interest to become a more inclusive society. So there's actually a, a sort of one of the fascinating things, that's slightly one of the harder things to get the grasp of, is, is when does the court want to expand? Because the court, and I'm thinking of sort of the, the development of, of institutions, when, when do the, the aristocrats, when did they go along with wanting to bring people in? Um, and we find that you know the aristocrats they like two things they like hunters very small concentrated system but once we get away from that once we start expanding they actually want to keep increasing the, they want to bring more and more people in so it's always in their interest so the, the, the leaders nearly always want to contract society the coalition can go either way and the people of course who are outside of the system who aren't privileged they always want to make the system more and more democratic more and more inclusive so relatively few times will leaders actually ever want to switch from being in some sense contractionary, wanting to be repressive. The few times they're going to actually have to adopt those policies is when they're sort of bankrupt. The, the real problem with running a repressive society is it doesn't encourage people to do any work. If people don't do any work, you can't tax them, you can't pay your cronies. So we find a lot of examples of when we see liberalization, when politicians actually do good things. They do th good things because they can't pay off their cronies without doing good things. And so they start to liberalize. And we can see you know, the Arab Spring were the lead up into getting into those problems was Egypt's uh, economy was doing very badly. 
uh, an economy that's based uh, largely on tourism means you have to have an educated population. So you start liberalizing, bringing more people in, getting people educated. Reform carries on. Now, some leaders manage to sort of get ahead of the ball, and they can just keep liberalizing enough always so that they defer the protests, so they've given away enough to the people, and eventually a sort of resource-poor country that's left to its own devices will democratize. So a nice example might be, that we talk about in the book, is, is Ghana. Mm -hmm. So Jerry Rawlings comes in, he tries to have a people's socialist revolution, he's cracking heads left, right and center, he's jacking up army pay to keep them loyal, and then he runs out of money, the country is completely broke, years of dictatorship has destroyed it, the coca crop is gone. He goes to the Soviets, say, I want to be a socialist, give me money. They go, we're short of money. No one will give him money. What did he have to do? He had to turn around to go to the people and do good things. And the people became empowered. Eventually, he couldn't stop them. They could demand more and more good things. And he delivered more and more good things. He's a, a leader who, in hindsight, looks like the poster boy for you know, um, uh, liberal economic reform. Um, but the reality was he cracked heads while he could afford it. He only did good things when he was forced to. Well, then, in a way, he actually is a, uh, uh, an example of, of the entire arc of your theory, right? I mean, it was in his self-interest to change. Yes. So he figured out, hmm, how am I going to stay in power? How am I going to keep this whole operation running? Not the way I did before, but the best way I can do for me Absolutely. So, Precisely. Right, right. So, That's why almost always bad things always do what will give you the best chance of staying in power, and once in a while that means doing good things. Does, you mentioned the, uh, the Arab Spring. What did Hosni Mubarak do wrong? He was a ah. th dictator for three decades. He ran one of the most successful countries in the Middle East, a uh, bulwark of the U.S. Uh, policy in the Mideast, which did some good things, yes. like sign a peace deal with Israel. Uh, what did he do wrong? Okay, an excellent question. Uh, let me preface mm. this by saying that using the theory in the Dictator's Handbook, on May the 5th, 2010, we predicted in a public lecture that uh, Hosni Mubarak was probably going to be gone in a year. Okay. Okay, excellent. <laughs> the first thing he did wrong, he had no control over. He got old. Um, dictatorial leaders are in deep trouble under three conditions to start with. They've just come to power. They don't quite know where the money is, so nobody quite trusts that they're going to be paid off properly, so they shop around. You survive the first couple of years, you're golden for a long time, until either the Ben Ali problem, you are believed to have a terminal illness. This is what did in Mobutu, this is what did in Marcos, this is what did in the Shah, this mm -hmm. is what did in Ben Ali. Or, uh, what's wrong with a terminal illness? Your cronies know you are no longer a reliable source of payment in the future. Or you are very old. Very old is a terminal illness. Uh, and so they again know you're not so reliable. So first problem, he grew old. He's 82. Second problem. His economy didn't have a vast amount of natural resource wealth. He depended on two sources of, broadly speaking, two sources of wealth. Uh, one was, uh, for example, tourism. Uh, tourism requires a relatively well-educated population. You have to have a lot of English speakers, a lot of French speakers. Uh, these are people who have enough education that they can think independently and might, because they come together in business mm -hmm. associations, begin to organize. Free assembly, very, very, very bad for a dictator. So he, he had the undergirding of that. Uh, and uh, foreign aid. Foreign aid is a great way to pay off your cronies if you're not generating a, an effective economy. President Obama announced when he uh, promulgated his Afghan policy, shortly after that, he announced that he was cutting foreign aid in Egypt in half. Indeed, within a few days, maybe it was two weeks, of his announcement that he was cutting foreign aid to Egypt in half, the Egyptian foreign minister, for the first time since 1979, referred to Israel as Egypt's enemy. And if you were a military leader, You'd be perhaps sitting there and thinking, well, the guy is getting old and decrepit. 
and he's not able to manage his relationship with the United States well enough to keep the money really flowing. Most of that money is coming to we, the military leaders. Now it's getting cut off. Maybe we better look around for somebody else. Maybe we should hedge our bets. So now you're sitting there on the sidelines, one of these re relatively well-educated people, unemployed, paying double the price for food, and you're thinking, you know, the military's probably going to sit on its hands. They're going to hedge their bets because the money's drying up. Mm -hmm. This is the time to rebel. So that, that is, as we saw it, the, uh, the perfect storm in, uh, in Egypt, C completely consistent with uh, was the argument in the book that we used to evaluate that. Um, we, we had done some statistical analysis on the countries that two or three years down the road, back then, were most likely to face regime change. Uh, Israel, Tunisia, uh, Morocco, Jordan were near the top of the list. In fact, Egypt was at the top of the list. Um, there was little he could do about the aging problem. You, you said he did some good things, like peace with uh, Israel. As we look at it, peace with Israel was not a policy he favored. It was not a policy, and we can see that very clearly now that the Egyptian people favored. He needed to have something to sell to the United States for money, right. something that we would value enough to pay a lot for. Son of a gun, <laughs> peace with Israel. And protect him. Yeah, and protect him, exactly. And we did for you know, 30, 30 years. 30. We can see a beautiful expression in this that it's not a policy that the Egyptian people were brought along with that we should love our fellow man across the border. It's, uh, you know, there wasn't a big campaign to educate tolerance towards uh, alternative religion. Israel was still on the grassroots, behold, uh, be treated as an enemy. And this is precisely what the government would want because you can't, if the people actually already like the Israelis, you can't sell, we're going to like the Israelis at a public policy. So, you know, we don't write books. We still write, you know, we still see Egyptian textbooks that say, you know, the Israelis aren't good people because we want to encourage hatred because we can sell that. And um, we can sort of see that uh, get, taking U.S. aid is, is not a popular policy. So the Pew, uh, the Pew Doers um, survey people, they do a big worldwide global studies. And they're, they're, it's amazing that the countries they pick out as the ones that are having the most anti-American feelings are the ones that get huge amounts of U.S. aid. The dictatorial countries, they're not liberal democracies. They're the countries that take enormous amounts of aid to undertake U.S. policies that are highly unpopular at home. So the Pakistanis, they hate the Americans. The Afghans, they hate the Americans. The Egyptians, they hate the Americans. Because we, we pay their leader to give them money, to pay off the military, to keep the people down, to adopt a policy that they don't like. They should, they should, they should be pretty miffed. Two, uh, uh, two things about Egypt. Um, in this entire discussion here, we haven't said the words Tahrir Square. Right? That uh, the it is it is separate and I guess utterly independent from your theory that of of why Egypt was primed primed to fall and Mubarak was primed to fall. Uh, that that there would be popular demonstrations, and I mean that 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 I think is the the, the worldwide See, idea of why he fell. Is it's that not quite separate from the theory. Um, so, take a step back and ask yourself why people were willing to demonstrate and they weren't willing to demonstrate five years ago. They felt they had license to now, right? Uh, they had um, less to lose because things were going badly in Egypt for them. And they had more to gain because exactly because the foreign aid was cut in half, they would have had a reason to believe that they will not face vast amount of oppression, which they would have faced five years earlier. So from the way we think about this, we think about this from a game theory perspective, they're doing what's called a backward induction. Your guy on the street, you're thinking, do I, do I want to demonstrate? No, I'm going to get my head bashed in. Uh, a little bit more educated, do I want to demonstrate, not this year, but oh, now I see the situation is changing. The loyalty of the military has been shaken. 
yeah, maybe, maybe they will sit on their hands. The risk of getting my head bashed in is still there, but it's lower. Mm -hmm. So if it gets low enough for enough people it's worth it, then others observe, gee, nothing happened to these folks. The military did not bash their heads. The military even protected them from the police who did try to bash their heads. More people take to the streets. So it is exactly this calculation. Is the leader vulnerable? People would always like to overthrow dictators. The problem that they face is that most of the time it's a very risky thing to do. When the moment arises, they, then they seize that moment. Well, in, in the Egyptian case, what you identified a, a few minutes ago is that the, the, the first to recognize this and act on it was the military, which is always the, the backbone of the country uh, and, and certainly was the, uh, a, a big part of the reason Mubarak was able to stay as long as he was. Now that the military is nominally in charge, they've announced elections uh, for, uh, well, they're not more than nominally in charge, they are in charge. Uh, they've announced elections for uh, November. Do you think uh, that the elections will actually proceed in Egypt, uh, or will the military make a second calculation that this holding pattern is probably better than the risk of an election? Uh, the, well, I think you're entirely right to say this holding pattern will continue because we have an election. So we're going to have elections that are probably unlikely to be truly meaningful. So there's unlikely to be a large amount of uh, free press. Um, there's the reinstitution of the sort of hated martial laws where people are picked up on the streets, given uh, short thrift by the courts and locked up for protesting. So there's not going to be a large scale demonstration. They're going to use repression against um, uh, religious extremist uh, groups arising that uh, threaten the stability. Um, so we're not going to see a particularly fair election. One of the great advantages that we sort of discussed earlier of, of having an election, particularly when it doesn't count for much, is an election's a great way of telling anybody that they could rise to the top. And anyone can be brought inside the government and become a person of importance. But precisely because there's a lot of people can be brought in, Everyone who's inside can be bought more cheaply. So that's the beauty of actually holding elections. So we're not actually big believers in forcing elections on countries where they're not really going to be meaningful. So in some sense, you know, Pakistan might have been better when it continued to be under a military junta. Uh, in both cases, the reality was the leaders beholden to only a small section of society. In one case, though, that small section of society doesn't have replacements, so the leader has to work hard in order to keep, in, in, in Musharraf's case, the army very happy. Um, whereas in you've got a, 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 or, um, an election that doesn't work well, it's a substitute mechanism to keep every, let everybody know that you're easily cut, you're easily replaced, and therefore they'll, they'll do the dirty work that you ask them to do for a smaller amount of money. They're more loyal. And uh, I want to follow up on something there, that, uh, the Musharraf example. Okay, so here's a guy who executes a successful military coup, takes over the country, mm -hmm. and becomes, for his own self-interest, uh, a U.S. partner, if not an ally, post 9-11. Uh, Figures. Otherwise, they're going to blow up my, they're going to, you know, overrun, invade my country, blow me up, whatever. Um, uh, the better thing to do is to help the Americans uh, go after terrorists. First thing the Americans do, after saying thank you and giving him <coughs> gazillions of dollars, is to say, you have to take off your uniform and hold elections. Was that a strategically poor choice for the United States because Musharraf was more useful to us in his previous role um, than the current government is? I'm going to answer that two ways. <coughs> Um, was it a strategic error for the United States? Yes. Do politicians in control in the United States differ from politicians elsewhere in the world? No. What do I mean by that? They're interested in what was good for them. And if it happened to be good for the United States, that's terrific. And if it happens not to be good for the United States, but it is good for them, that too is terrific. So their calculation is how do my constituents respond to this? Not how does grand strategy respond to this? How does this affect the country's welfare five years, six years down the road? But how do my constituents react? My constituents don't like our backing military dictators, so they're going to react well to this. 
therefore I'm going to promote that policy. Right. So sticking with Pakistan uh, uh, for a bit here, there is a <coughs> popularly elected government in Pakistan uh, backed by the military generally uh, assumed to, to, to really run the show. Does that model still fit your theory? I mean, can you have essentially a front man? Can you have somebody out there who is the person with whom the United States deals directly, Zardari in this case, um, who's mentioned in, in, in your book uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, admiringly for his ability to... Uh, to, uh, to Steal. Yes, it, well, it, okay, there it, you go. That is, that is a tongue-in-cheek cheek yes. admiration. Uh, yes, he is um, good at it. Yeah, so perhaps, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. But I mean, it, it, is is he a dictator? Is 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 he does he fit your your uh, your model? Well, here? You, this is the beauty of the democratic systems that haven't evolved very well. We have elections, so we'd like to think of the classic one man, one vote, one one person, one vote. This is the way we like to think about elections functioning. But in many many cases, we find that people actually implicitly end up voting in big blocks. So if we were to think of uh, a Pakistan case, we go to a rural area, a politician will show up and they will make an implicit deal with the, 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 the village elders that if this village deliver enough votes, they will get stuff. They won't be getting much because there are lots of other people they can buy them for, but they're going to get a few jobs that are going to go that way. There's going to be some crumbs are going to go down to that village. So delivering those votes for a politician who's almost certainly going to win in a particular area is going to get them those few crumbs. So people go along with what the village elder tells them to do. So when we've got people isolated in these systems, politicians are very good at playing them off. We'll give you a few little things. It's not much, but if you don't vote for us, we're going to get elected anyway and you didn't help us, so we're going to give you nothing. So, you know, during the floods last year, I, I worked with a colleague, uh, Alejandro Flores Quarez, uh, who's now at the University of Essex, and he, you know, him and I are doing, uh, were looking at natural disasters, and one of the things we saw was a distribution of aid. It was vastly towards Zadari's supporters. So the probability of you getting any assistance greatly increased if you came from regions that supported parties that were part of his coalition. You came from the opposition, you got nothing. Um, so just literally the simple things that we think of as handing out blankets are driven by these politics of buying things. We see the same thing in the US. It turns out handing out federal disaster aid, uh, we can predict which districts are going to go. This has become a, a sort of burgeoning part of the technical literature about, you know, where do we distribute FEMA aid? And it turns out elections are just as important as wind speed. <laughs> um, but not to the same extent that it is in Pakistan. In Pakistan, there were instances where, you know, if we take that, if we break the dam here, we can run this water through this guy's estate into the desert and save hundreds of villages down. Unfortunately, the guy whose land it was going to go through was a member of the cabinet, and he sort of went up on the bridge and said, this isn't going to happen. So we see bad public policy. We see redistribution. We're saving the few chosen, even though the system is nominally democratic. Now, one of the things that we uh, are hoping to cure people of with the dictator's handbook is the distinction of categorical regimes, democracy, autocracy, monarchy, junta. Uh, for instance, um, when we talk about this winning coalition drawn from a pool of people, the selectorate. All democracies have the characteristic that the selectorate is very large, the pool of people, and the winning coalition is relatively large, but highly variable in size. In Britain, to uh, control uh, the prime ministership, a candidate in a two-party race needs to win half of the parliamentary districts with half of the votes. So they only need 25% of the vote. 75% of the vote, properly distributed, could have gone the other way. Um, in the United States, we estimate that you can control the House, the Senate, and the presidency with as little as 20% of the vote. What that means is that when you're doling out rewards, you're focused on who do you absolutely have to have, not just who backs you. Uh, in other systems, you need much closer to a simple majority of the vote. It, it varies all over the place. In Pakistan, uh, 
for it, you need a very small percentage of the vote to control the country. I, I think we estimated somewhere, I, I don't remember the exact number, somewhere around 10%. Well, that fundamentally changes how much public good you do and how much corruption you engage in. They're going to be a lot more corrupt than we are. Will they be as corrupt as North Korea? No. We're, you know, North Korea, Kim Jong-il depends on maybe 200 people out of uh, almost 20 million people. He can be much more corrupt. But Zadari is uh, in a position to steal a heck of a lot and to allow his coalition of backers to steal a heck of a lot. That's why they're loyal to him. They're not loyal to him because they think he has better policy ideas. They're loyal to him because he's, he's making sure the blankets go to them and, and not to the other person who was flooded who didn't vote the right way. So <coughs> continuing the, the, uh, the sort of U.S.-centric uh, line of questioning here just for a minute, what the U.S. now wants from Zodari uh, and, and, and Pakistan is, is two things, basically. One, keep a lid on... Uh, uh, terrorism so it doesn't uh, mm -hmm. become a external threat uh, to the United States, whether in Afghanistan or, or, or elsewhere. And sort of a subset of that, specifically go after these groups that, that primarily operate along, along the Afghan border. Um, is that, it, it, neither of which Pakistan has done fully, despite Zardari's right. promises. So if it, is, it, is it in Zardari's interest to stay in power, to keep the, to, 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 to follow the rules of, of the dictator's handbook, to do any of those things? Right. So just before the dictator's handbook, I wrote a book called The Prediction Years Game. And the penultimate chapter of that book is about how much aid it would take the United States, from the United States, to get the Pakistanis to pursue the Taliban and so forth. Uh, it's about one and a half billion a year, and the book makes the point that for that amount of money, we'll get the optimal effort. We shouldn't expect them to wipe out the Taliban. We shouldn't expect them to wipe out Al Qaeda in Pakistan, because if they do, the money will stop. We have no reason to give them money. If that's the objective, if they fix the problem, as much as Mubarak did not work hard at educating Egyptians to love Israel, because the money would stop flowing. So um, the Zadari government, a little bit more nuanced, but the Zadari government uh, was working reasonably hard at tracking down and uh, killing or capturing uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda leaders. Uh, in February of 2010, they killed the number two uh, mm -hmm. Taliban leader and so forth. Uh, so they were delivering enough to keep the money flowing. Now they have an additional problem we have to recognize, and again it goes back to the theory, there's not a Pakistani leader. Uh, so Zardari and has, has his set of cronies, the ISA has its own interests, the rest of the military has other interests, so he has to weave a coalition together. He's not been very good at getting the ISA, uh, ISI on board. Uh, so uh, then there are questions of, so what would it take to change their behavior more than we're willing to pay. Because their longer term interest is, is get us out of the way and ally with these guys. Well, I mean, the ISI is essentially operating uh, organizationally the way you, you, yes. you lay out, right? I mean, they're, they're Zodari is sort of irrelevant. I mean, right, they, exactly. they, they exactly. have to figure out how are we strategically going to be able to continue our power base and to be able to call the shots Precisely. to the extent possible in Af Afghanistan, plus, oh, wait, we've got to worry about India. So they're, they're looking out. They're oh, looking out for them. <laughs> and they're doing good, a good job of it, unfortunately. Um, you you uh, talked to me, we were talking about uh, Egypt, about the sort of the, the, the gradual willingness of people to take greater risk, uh, to demonstrate against the government, to, uh, you know, to go against the government, period. Um, how, how does that contrast in Libya, where we did see uh, protests taking place in, and, well, and, and in Syria now, we see protests taking place in the face of really horrific government violence that people are willing to brave? Right. So Libya, 
Libya is a case where Muammar Gaddafi violated one of the five rules that Bruce went through earlier. He made a classic mistake. He actually was too nice to the people. I mean, we find that hard to believe because we live in the United States where our president's beholden to 35 million people. So he's got to keep a lot of us happy. Um, Muammar Gaddafi didn't have that problem yet compared to some of his neighbors, he'd been comparatively nice. So Libyans got substantially more education than neighbors in Tunisia, in the Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Jordan, and in Syria. He didn't need to educate the people in some sense. He was making a big error because most of his oil was extracted by foreign workers. If they protested, he just sends them home and gets some more. So we didn't need to educate the people. A big mistake to make. 2005, of the country I just mentioned, he had the biggest restrictions on press freedoms. By far, outlier in terms of how draconian his restrictions were. Uh, 2010, he was fourth tied down with Saudi Arabia and very close to Saudi Arabia. All the others had put in more press restrictions than him. He'd allowed people to start to talk, and that was a big problem. Then we get a little spark, and suddenly people see, wow, the regimes around us aren't as strong as we thought, so that's more information that they think maybe it's safe, everything is going wrong. And uh, so people took to the streets. Uh, he'd given them the opportunity to organize. Uh, he hadn't broken enough. He hadn't been smashing in enough heads and people took this as a sign of weakness. It turned out, I don't think he was that weak, but then the NATO military stopped him actually being able to deploy the people who were willing to break heads. He's, I mean, you look at him, he had phenomenal loyalty. There are still people backing him, even though he, he's stuck in remote towns now, but he still has a few bunch of fanatic supporters who are staying loyal to the very end. So, Ours is not a happy view of the world. <laughs> yeah, and no. you know, the, well, the, 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 let's, let's pick up from here. Yeah. You know, the sad thing is, I, I think this has been a, a really poorly implemented policy by the West, because the reality is the next group of leaders that are going to come in, they're going to have unfrozen assets, they're going to have billions of dollars pouring in, the oil revenue is going to come back in, the countries are washed with weapons. You know, the, the people are going to be fighting to become the monopolist in terms of power who can buy the most loyalty, get the weapons pointed at everybody else. Then from there, they're going to cull out the supporters they don't really need. We're going to be back in the same type of system that we have before. Uh, we're going to have a leader who's going to be very hard to buy because he's got lots of his own wealth. And he's going to be brutal to the people. A different set of people are going to be persecuted to the people that were persecuted under, um, under the former colonel. But I don't see anything different changing. And, you know, he made an error. I can't of uh, being too kind. It's unlikely that the next guy is going to make the same mistake. The Syrian case looks quite different. Uh, and indeed, w we are, as Alistair just said, quite pessimistic about the future of Libya. We're optimistic about the future of Syria. There are places where we're optimists. Um, in the Syrian case, so uh, Assad was looking at an economy uh, with 9% uh, deficit annually. Uh, relative to GDP. It's a very big, right. you know, we complain at our, that <laughs> they're way, way ahead. Uh, and um, so he was facing an economy, again, with uh, some educated people, unemployed. He, he had some natural resource wealth that, unlike mm -hmm. Libya's, was rapidly declining, becoming a smaller and smaller part of his economy. Foreign aid uh, to Syria was slowly drying up. So all of the economic conditions were bad news for him, making the risk uh, more attractive to people. He has been brutal in his response to that risk. People have continued to fight. Uh, and because Syria does not have vast natural resource wealth, and if uh, it is also not flooded with foreign aid when Assad finally falls, then Syria will probably become a reasonably uh, liberalized place. If it is flooded with foreign aid out of good intentions, very bad news because then the new leaders will be in a position to do the bribery that's necessary to shore themselves up and no need to listen to the people. So we have to hope the foreign aid doesn't come except after performance benchmarks are met have free assembly, have free press, et cetera, have free speech. You can borrow against promised aid for a year. You don't get the lump. Um, and 
you, if you meet those conditions, you get it promised right. again, escrowed for the next year, until you're entrenched in free speech, free press, freedom of assembly. If you have those things in place, it's really tough for leaders to be oppressive. Does, so is your advice then uh, to President Obama that uh, he not uh, reward uh, any of these uh, governments too richly that uh, what, whatever, uh, you know, civilian, maybe slightly military flavored uh, government may emerge in, in, uh, in, in Egypt, uh, potential follow on to, uh, to Assad, keep your distance? So Egypt's a little bit more complicated. I want to yeah. come back yeah. to that. Um, in general, yes. Uh, in general, th one of the big effects of foreign aid is to significantly increase the probability that a, an oppressive dictatorial regime stays in power. Uh, it has a significant impact on the survival of dictators. So Egypt is more complicated because although that remains true, uh, the president has to play that against its, the impact of hostility towards Israel on his reelection prospects. So. Uh, basically, yes, it right. always comes back to, yeah, it's not national interest, it's the politician's interest. Uh, so in, in that case, uh, one of two things has to, has to happen. We either are going to have to pay a lot bigger price to Israel if, for example, there is an election and the Muslim Brotherhood... In, in Egypt. In, in Egypt, I'm sorry, and the Muslim Brotherhood in alignment with the military controls the country, the price of maintaining good relations with Israel goes way up. So we have to decide, will we pay that much higher price? Is that worth it in terms of domestic votes? Or do we leave it to the Israelis and others to manage that problem on their own? My guess is we'll pay the price. We only uh, ha have a minute left. Um, also, you have the last word. Um, you've uh, given a little bit of advice to uh, uh, President Obama in, a, in an article in Foreign Policy uh, this month. Um, what's the single worst thing that President Obama could do uh, in the in the couple of years he's got left, um, according to, uh, uh, well, to your theory? Well, again, we, you you use the term worst. We always want to go back to the worst for whom. Uh, are we talking about the U.S. people as a whole? Are we talking about for himself? So he could spend all his time and resources focusing on making the U.S. great. That might not be such a great policy for him or for the Democrats come the next election. Um, so we have to, you know, I, I want to clarify your question. If he wants to do the best for him, which is what we expect he will, and what, according to, you know, the incentives he has, he should be doing. He'll be trying to shore up Democratic voters. So he'll be trying to make sure that we have benefits for unions. We get more education for teachers. Because teachers and union workers, they vote Democratic. How are we going to fund these things? Well, we want to tax the rich. Why? Because the rich tend to be Republican voters, so we want to bring money in, want to redistribute it out. So the best thing for him would be to focus on making his supporters, the ones he needs, as happy as possible. The Republicans, of course, they want him out of office, so what are they going to do? They're going to try and do exactly the stuff. They're going to cut the benefits to the... We're going to say... We could say poor, but we're going to say Democrats, and that lets them have tax breaks for the rich a.k.a. the Republicans. Alistair Schmidt, Bruce Bueno de Mosquita, thank you very much, both of you. I've, I really enjoyed the book, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, having a chance to, uh, to hear more about it as you, uh, uh, I guess it, it comes out uh, right today. at the end of the month. Today. Today, oh, today is oh, the day. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you very you. much. Five million votes is enough to win the presidency. In a country, we might think of it as a democracy, but that's a country of a, over 300 million people because not everybody's eligible. And if you can pick the right votes in the right states, you can win half the electoral college seats, and that's all you need to win. Mm -hmm. So that's always a thing to remember is the president gets more votes than that, but how many does he need? And we can sort of see that 
uh, Congress at the moment, the debate between the Republicans and Democrats is tailored towards rewarding a smaller section of society than rewarding everybody. If we take the system down to an even smaller system, when we're talking, for example, we could go, uh, let's, let's move away from politics to a moment, we talk about a business enterprise, and we, we might sort of wonder why is it that Wall Street firms have been paying out huge bonuses you know, the people are in uproar, the people want these guys, they want to rip their livers out. You know, these people are feeding from the public purse to pay big bonuses. And, and what's the reason here? Well, most publicly traded corporations, they run like autocracies. There's a relatively small number of board members, senior executives, institutional investors, you know, often in the tens, certainly not much more than the hundreds, who are really important to staying at the top. So how do you reward a small number of people? Well, you pay them hugely. You give them enormous bonuses. You don't run them by giving out public goods. So we see that everybody would like to get cut down the number of people they're beholden to because that lets them to give fabulous wealth to those small numbers of supporters. Is that why, uh, for example, uh, CEOs and board members get paid lots of money, but so, so do college uh, uh, big, you know, big Ten uh, football coaches, right? Yes. Yes, the highest paid uh, government employee uh, in, at the federal level in the United States is the coach of the Army football team. Really? Yes, <laughs> by far. It's not even close. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 Alistair Fabulous. makes a very important point about uh, democracy. So democratic leaders have the misfortune of needing a lot of people to support them, but they work as hard as they can to reduce that number of people. Um, so, the Congress is one of the least popular institutions in the United States, and yet... Hello, I'm Ann Guerin. We are going to talk today about a uh, new book, The Dictator's Handbook, which, as I understand, builds on work that both of you have done uh, over a number of years um, in, uh, in, in some previous uh, political science work. Can you explain how The Dictator's Handbook is different from your previous theories about how dictators and autocracies function differently than, uh, than, than democracies. And at whom is this book primarily aimed? Well, uh, the prior work, uh, academic work, uh, take the, our book, The Logic of Political Survival, it's a 500 page book with about 150 pages of calculus. There's no calculus in this book. There are no statistics in this book. There's not even algebra in this book. That's an important difference. This There's is a little a math. <laughs> There's a little math, right? <laughs> this is a book uh, aimed at an intelligent, politically interested audience, uh, people who read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, uh, people like that. Uh, the earlier work was aimed at the three other academics who want to read uh, 150 pages of calculus. <laughs> would that be a fair description? And that would be exactly fair. We've tried here to uh, popularize and translate difficult technical material into something that's straightforward and easy to understand because our arguments are very general. They're about how political organizations, how religious organizations, how corporations, how charities, how any kind of organization works. And so all we needed to, uh, the, the purpose of this book was we spend a lot of time talking to students, talking to fellow academics, and of course we never talk about, you know, the, the following function is increasing and all the calculus terms, and we don't give the statistics all the time. We use an example, and we just thought, so we decided to write the book, and to be honest, it was a book that wrote itself. It was incredibly easy because we have this wonderful idea about how politics works, that it's based upon self-interest and constraints that people have to operate within this system, and, you know, the jostling of who's going who's to get their way and who isn't. And it was a book that we'd say we just, story after story, just fell into place. And so we've written it for a general audience. Can you explain a bit more about that theory of self-interest that goes back to some, to, to some of your earlier work? Is it always the case that a leader will act primarily in his or her self-interest, uh, trumping every other absolute. potential motivation? Well, that, that's the absolute dominant motivation. So people have different things that they would like to do, and if they have some discretion, they may want to advance good public works projects. They may want to push for some kind of uh, religious preference over something. But they, first and foremost, you can't do any of that stuff until you secured yourself in power.
and taking care of the people who keep you in power. So that's what has to be done first. So before anything else, people take care of that. Well, we don't deny that there might be sort of benevolent people who care about others first, but they're not the ones that crushed the heads that got them to the top in the first place. How far across the political uh, spectrum does that uh, theory of paramount the self-interest extend? I mean, I can understand in a country in which there's a, a, a cult of personality, one leader who gets to essentially make all the decisions, um, that that would be an easier model to sustain than it might be in uh, a country where, say, there's a junta or uh, going all the way on the other side where there is a democratically elected government. How far does that spread? So the theory applies to all governments, indeed, to all organizations. Now, what the theory tells us is that leaders need to obey to the extent that they can five rules. The problem that they have, which is what you're alluding to, is that depending upon the nature of the political system, the uh, amount of constraints they face in changing the way the system operates is greater or lesser. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as we see it, leaders want to depend on as few people as possible to keep them in power. They want those few people to be drawn. A lot of, uh, of, of rules, I mean, you, you listed the five um, main ones, but it, it, it almost sounds as if a good, durable dictatorship is, is, is a bit of an accident of history. I mean, how could all of those things so uh, easily be reproduced in so many countries over... Uh, over well, it's not an accident of history. In, in fact, one of our technical papers is about how it is that some governments evolve to be democratic and some governments evolve to be dictatorial or autocratic, um, it's actually very easy to construct a dictatorship. Take an example, we, we, we use this analogy in the book. Suppose we're in a room of 100 people and five of us have guns. The five of us are going to run that room mm -hmm. if nobody else has a gun. So uh, dictatorship creation of dictatorship is generally about controlling violence, controlling the opportunity to engage in violence and not being hesitant about using it. Um, democracy is about being very hesitant to use it because we will throw the rascals out. Uh, we, we, we vote with the ballot box instead of the bullet. It's much harder to construct democracy than dictatorship. Well, I mean, by your model, democracy is a, a, a much more self-limiting operation, right? I mean, you can't, you can't do all of those things over and over and over and over and over again in a democracy because, as you say, you'll, you'll throw, throw the bums out. Um, but it, it, it also just sort of isn't built that way, right? You can't, as you say, bribe that many people. You can't, you can't effectively mm -hmm. run that large an organization if people keep getting to vote on how that organization is being run. Am, am, am I Well, we you always here? have to have an executive that makes decisions. So we have leaders, we choose to retain them if they do the things that we like. And so the basis of the theory is, what does it mean to do things that we like? And it turns out things that we like depend upon how many of us get to pick. So this is the, the basis of the argument. In a democracy, there's many, many people. So in the US, to be president, you need about 35, 34, 34. On from as large a pool of available people as possible, they want to tax people as much as they can, subject to the limitation that they not try to tax so much that the economy collapses on their watch and not so much that they foment a rebellion. So there's an optimal level. They want to make sure to pay those few people they need properly so that those folks won't want to defect to somebody else, not a penny more. And they don't want to make the mistake of spending money on people who are not essential to keep them in power. So as we see it, um, a dictator, com contrast with a junta leader, uh, what people think of as a dictator is somebody who depends on very few people drawn from a relatively large pool of people. For example, uh, Lenin invented a universal adult suffrage system in which everybody knew the elections were rigged, mm 
but there was a very small probability for any individual that they could get into that little group of insiders. It wasn't the royal family as it had been, uh, and they could get payoffs. They could get lots of benefits. As the set of people you depend on gets bigger, bribing people gets to be too expensive. You know, if you have to bribe 100 people, not so hard. If you have to bribe 10 million people, it's better to start producing effective public policy. It's cheaper than the bribery. So as the coalition that you depend on gets bigger, loyalty to the leader gets weaker because they're saturating more of the pool, so there's not a lot of substitutes. Uh, the p quality of policy gets better, and the leader gets thrown out of office more quickly. So a junta leader depends on a small coalition, just like a dictator, but a junta leader depends on a small coalition drawn from a small group, for example, of generals. And a dictator depends on a small coalition potentially drawn from a huge coalition. So the junta leader doesn't have as much loyalty. They, get, they face coups and overthrow much more frequently than the guy who has the same little coalition but drawn from a big pool where everybody knows they're easily replaced. Those are an awful lot.